Everyone, welcome to Manufacturing Hub. Uh, as I was telling Nick, Nikki and Sarah as we were joining, that the first couple of minutes are typically community comments, and we are going to start chatting a little bit about supply chain. And it is a topic that we will get just the, the slightest little bit um, into because it is something that is Sarah and Nikki and, well, almost everyone on this talks about a, a whole lot more often than we do, but we are happy on Manufacturing Hub in order to uh, to chat about it a little bit. Um, as we get into it, and if you have not uh, seen the show, everyone, welcome. Typically, I am normally with a guy named Vlad. Karim is joining us this week as Vlad has left on, on vacation. He may or may not be watching us. Uh, so, Vlad, if you're in the comments, uh, hey, I hope Cuba is good and warm and, and all of those other things. Um, as we get ready to get in, we want to thank Phoenix Contact for sponsoring this episode and the entirety of the month of August. If you're new to the show, please go ahead and check us out on manufacturinghub.live, which is where you can catch the last 74 episodes. We do live shows Wednesday afternoons, and our podcast comes out on sometime on Thursday. We haven't quite hit the correct time that uh, that, that, get, that gets launched every week on Thursdays. Uh, but without further ado, um, officially, everyone, welcome to Manufacturing Hub with me and not with Vlad once again this week. This week, we are having a supply chain roundtable, and I'm very happy to, to welcome our guest, Sarah Scudder, um, marketing maven of Source Day. And if you guys see her on LinkedIn, she's the one with the most awesome everything green. I am, in fact, wearing my my green Source Day uh, hoodie or my green Source Day fleece just for Sarah and Nikki Gonzalez from Quote Beam. Uh, Sarah, uh, Nikki, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dave. Absolutely. I'm, I'm joining from Austin, my first summer here, and I am not used to hail and thunderstorms and lightning in the summer. So if my hair looks a little wild and crazy, you know why. Okay. Yeah. I my like hair that. Is Texas is it's not friendly to my hair either. I'm in Houston, by the way. So and we've been having the thunderstorms lately. <laughs> Hashtag yeah. bad hair week. Uh, I, I love it. Um, I'd like to, I love it. I'd like to let everyone kind of introduce themselves a little bit more. Uh, maybe talk. I know both Nikki and Sarah have at least one show that they do. So, Sarah, could you give us uh, and everyone in the audience a little bit uh, more of an introduction on you, please? Yeah, absolutely. So I thought by this stage in my career, I would be producing fashion shows. I did runway modeling in high school and was planning to pursue a career in fashion. I randomly at the end of my senior year was offered a job in an industry that I couldn't spell or knew absolutely nothing about, which was this crazy word called procurement and supply chain. I decided to take the leap and take the job at a very, very small company because I wanted to learn every aspect of business and thought my personality and style was more suited for small business versus going and working for a big company. So I spent the first part of my career in supply chain technology sales, actually selling into uh, people in supply chain roles and specifically in marketing procurement. And as I progressed in my sales career, I decided that I absolutely loved demand generation and education and content production. So I decided to pivot my career from sales into marketing and embraced this crazy thing called LinkedIn about three years ago, which has changed my life in tremendous ways, um, both personally and professionally. And about 10 months ago, I joined Source Day as the chief marketing officer. We are a supply chain technology solution that automates purchase order changes. And one of the major verticals that we work in is manufacturing. I am a supply chain nerd. I talk about it all the time with every single person I meet. I'm obsessed with the color green. I wear it every single day in some capacity. Right now I have green toes. And I want to marry Bradley Cooper. I've been trying to get a dinner date with him for three years. My cell phone cover is a half-naked photo of Bradley. And if anybody knows him, I would absolutely <laughs> love an introduction. He is still single and waiting to meet the woman of his dreams. 
Love it. That may be the best introduction mm -hmm. anyone has ever done on anything. So, so th Probably. thank you very much for Sarah. <laughs> If any of our listeners knows Bradley Cooper, you, you know who to, to drop a message to um, on this show. N Nikki, I, I'm not sure if I, I would want I to go. I follow that. I, I was going to say, I'm not sure if I would want to go after that. So you're more than welcome to give a real introduction or, or just make something uh, completely up. But, but for anyone who, who doesn't know you, can you, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, please? Yeah, okay. Um, to not make this an entire hour-long introduction of me, I'll try to be brief. I started working for my dad when I was in middle school at a small business. Um, he's an engineer turned entrepreneur, and I got the bug to do business, but I never really knew exactly <laughs> what I wanted to do. Um, I loved having meetings with people and talking and figuring out their problems and jumping in wherever something needed to be done. So I made user manuals for uh, terminals that go into trucks, and I went to trucking trade shows, and I made... Uh, marketing material and um, all kinds of stuff. And I found my way into technical sales sort of accidentally. I got a business degree as an international in international business from UT Austin. I spent some time in Austin, loved it. Still didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, so I looked for technical X roles that didn't require an engineering degree. And I ended up becoming a machine vision sales engineer with Keyence. And I moved out to the West Coast, uh, Again, inadvertently landing in the San Francisco Bay Area, not knowing what a uh, treasure trove of innovation and amazingness I was landing into. I actually wanted to move to Seattle, but they didn't have any openings. And I got to go into factories of all kinds because the Bay Area is a little microcosm of all kinds of cool stuff, right? Um, high tech manufacturing, uh, electronics, semiconductors, solar cells. And also poultry and plastic bottles and wineries and ice cream and pretty much anything you can think of is either made in San Francisco Bay Area or the Valley in California. And I drove uh, a lot of miles and visited a lot of factories. And machine vision is an amazing uh, technology that I had a lot of fun with. It was also really stressful because I was the end to end uh, salesperson and applications engineer and test person and uh, technical support and trainer. And so I really got a crash course in, you know, figuring out problems and making sure they work after the fact. And then I got really interested in the upstream and downstream stuff that was happening on the production lines that I was setting up inspections for. And so like, uh, I realized I'm a perpetually curious person that enjoys myself most at the bottom of a steep learning curve. And once I really knew vision really well, I got bored with it. And uh, <laughs> I liked mechatronics and I went to go work for Festo. And uh, they actually had some supply chain issues back in, even back in 2012. Uh, and I had a hard time sleeping at night when some stuff I sold wasn't delivered on time or I would get a notification um, or not a notification, a delivery got missed and all of a sudden my customer's calling me and where is this part I ordered? It was supposed to be a six week lead time and I check my system and it's like, well, now it shows another three weeks and then two weeks from then it shows another four weeks. And I realized, you know, as a salesperson, I was basically spending over half my time proactively managing these types of fires, um, sticking stock to the side Proactively, I was keeping spares and samples in my trunk for customers to be able to fill in the gaps. And um, it was exhausting. So I went into software because at least if you sell it, it's already been made. <laughs> and I went into a virtual prototyping of electronic devices, doing electromagnetic simulation on uh, physics, physics based modeling, different, you know, some multi physics, but mostly electromagnetics, uh, looking at designing phones and putting antennas in the right place and designing for manufacturability and being able to run tests before you have to make physical prototypes. Uh, so that was extremely enlightening. I got frustrated with some of the technology that we were using. Um, I was creating training classes and things like that, but I couldn't segment my customer base and invite them to the right trainings. Like you don't want to invite an engineer that focuses on thermal simulation to a, you know, low frequency motor simulation workshop. And so I foolishly did something I would never advise people, quit my job without a plan, uh, went to go work for a bunch of startups for equity or for free or for this or for that, um, just to kind of get the lay of the land and figure out what's going on out there. And I ended up working with a startup in the supply chain space 
uh, using big data and analytics to predict demand for items at a store level. And we were doing this mostly in the movie industries, which I had no experience with, but it's kind of where we found our niche and landed. And we were uh, predicting which you know movie titles were going to sell at which WalMarts and Best Buys and Targets around the country so they could actually ship the right amount and not have a bunch of overstocks and out of stocks uh, at different locations. And that was a huge learning for me as well. I didn't know much about, you know, artificial intelligence and data science and, you know, marrying POS data with weather data and box office data and all this cool stuff to predict, you know, to get a better handle on where we should be sending materials and where the demand actually is. And I did that for a while. And then um, I was speaking at a lot of conferences at the time. I was at an AI conference when my daughter, I guess she's in a rush like I am most of the time, decided to come seven weeks early uh, and my water broke and I sort of took some time off after that and came back into, it's a long story short with QuoteBeam, uh, applying a lot of these really weird experiences that I've had. Um, they kind of all come together in this software platform that we're building now to help modernize the procurement experience and the supply chain in the industrial automation world when it comes to finding and buying automation parts. And yeah, so I spend a lot of time now both helping build a company and a software and relationships and at the same time kind of in the trenches procuring stuff for people that they can't find uh, through their normal channels. Wow, that, that is amazing. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Nikki. I, I think that this may be the most diverse roundtable we've ever had, especially with Karim up here. I think that there are there are zero degreed engineers in this conversation, which has got to be a first uh, for this show. So so thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that, Nikki. I, I love that. I, I absolutely want to dig into to more of, of all of that. But if I may, at first, I want to take us back uh, a little bit more on manufacturing, on why I assume most people are currently listening uh, to this show, right? So, uh, so early middle of my career, I spent some time working for a distributors rep, uh, manu or uh, for a distributor manufacturers rep, right? Great company out of the Mid Atlantic, one of their major, uh, one of their major vendors, Honeywell Process Solutions. At some point, shortly before that, moved uh, th there where they were producing from Pennsylvania, uh, a drive away. From, uh, from where the, the headquarters was uh, down to Mexico. And I remember the first time I got a, a, a response at like, I'm looking for a, a UDC, right? So I'm looking for a particular controller and I'm like, guys, how long is it going to take, right? And so lots of times they might have it on the shelf and it's going to take a couple of weeks to ship up to Mexico. But what became more and more frequent is, hey, it's going to be 52 weeks or it's going to be 26 weeks, but no one really believed the 26 weeks. So it was going to be 52 weeks. And I remember the, the first time I told a customer that it was going to be an entire year before they were going to be able to get their thing. And, and I thought that they were going to go crazy. Right. So every once in a while, you get someone who was upset because they actually needed the thing. But more often than not, I found people were generally okay with, hey, we don't have it. It's going to be, you know, 52 weeks. Or we're assuming it's going to be 52 weeks, but we have no idea when, it, when it's going to be. Uh, and so I was talking to my dad somewhere around that point in time. And he was saying that when, when he started his career in the 70s, before we got to just-in-time inventory and before we leaned out the supply chain and we wanted to stock a the smallest amount humanly possible it was very regular for them to say hey it's going to be half a year or a year in order to get the parts and so you did a little bit better of a job looking forward as to what you needed you did a little bit better job putting parts on stock right and what i have found with my customer at that with my customers at that point in time and also in the supply chain today is because we don't know how long it's going to take right so we've got some vendors who are quoting call it a, a year right but everyone knows that they're not actually going to hit the year target and it may be six weeks and it shows up super early it may be 72 weeks and it shows up super late. So what I find is that lots of people are, are over purchasing, right? So people are over purchasing and they're, they're buying more in order to make sure that they have the parts that they need. And that is very much congesting the supply chain. And I've also found something else 
um, th that is interesting. And we're gonna, I'm going to ask Nikki to, to speak on it, right? So I find that most smaller manufacturers, reps, distributors have parts. Lots of them have parts on shelves, but very few of them do a good job showing online the, the parts that they have. So I may order, you know, my, my parts from Karim and Karim tries to order it from the factory, but Karim could go purchase almost directly from Sarah because Sarah has 10 of these parts on the shelf. And I know, Nikki, you guys at QuoteBeam have been doing a, a fair amount of work working on kind, trying to kind of understand what, what everyone in the market has parts-wise. Um, can you share a little bit of your experiences with, with that and having as many conversations as you've been having, please? Yeah, so the thing is, you know, our industry, it has these very complex um, uh, channels through which mm -hmm. they sell, right? The manufacturers, they sell some direct to some accounts. Some of them sell direct, some of them don't. Some of them sell through distribution or both. And you have this, this there are, I think, about 17,000 independent distributors of electrical and automation and sort of industrial parts just in North America. Um, a lot of them are fairly small, medium size, either, you know, a lot of them are employee owned or family owned or just, you know, what you would consider small to medium sized businesses that serve their local customers really well. Um, but they are not used to operating in sort of an online, you know, global world. And mm -hmm. they're definitely not used to these types of challenges where they can't get what they need from their vendors um, a lot of s distributors in North America have been conditioned to this more just in time and, and you know, keeping lean inventory. So oftentimes they order what their big customers order. They keep mm -hmm. that on the shelf because they know that their customer is expecting that, you know, amount of, oh, we order something all the time. So we're going to, you know, you're going to stock it for us. But their stocking decisions are usually based on just what their local customers are buying. And then they end up in situations where maybe a local customer had a project or a need for a long time and then they stopped making that product or they had a one-off project where they stocked some stuff and then didn't get sold. And they don't have any really outlet for that stock to get sold to somebody else because they're not mm -hmm. looking at the broader market. Um, their salespeople are you know, taking phone calls and sending PDFs and they're very reactive in a lot of ways. And so they end up with pockets of product that just sitting on their shelf that nobody in their local customer base wants um, sometimes they're sold that they've gone obsolete. They will have layers of dust on them and that's clogging up their shelves. And at the same time, you know, they're, they're making these sort of reacting decisions, both based on what to stock and then who they're selling to, uh, which is unfortunate because now that we're in this situation where globally everybody, you know, needs products that if they're on the shelf, there's definitely somebody out there, out there that needs it. Um, but there's no visibility between these distributors and they often don't have, you know, the, the vendors themselves don't have visibility as to what's in stock at their distributors. And again, this varies, you know, by the vendors. Some of them have more sophisticated supply chains than others where the distributors send back stocking reports or, you know, they share POS data, but on the mm -hmm. whole, our industry has been very siloed in terms of how it operates the sales channels. Um, and oftentimes the vendors don't know, what you know who the end users are what the real demand is on the ground because there's such a you know removal of layers in that sense and the sharing of information is somewhat limited um so it's led to this big mismatch in supply and demand and and the problem that's missing is the communication and the connectivity um so what we're on a mission to do is try to bring all this hidden stock to light because when we have we work with distributors to bring their inventory online, to be able to connect it to the internet, to users that are just looking for it, as well as procurement networks and, um, you know, ERP connections. We're really all about, you know, community and building a network where if we can, you know, have some co cooperation between the spokes of this uh, channel infrastructure, then I think we can, you know, do a lot more to help in the situation now short term, but also build something better for the future in the long run. Because one of the issues we have, I think, in manufacturing is it's hard to forecast what you need to be stocking and building if you don't know what the actual demand is either, mm -hmm. because you don't have access to that information on a, on a granular basis. Um, so that's... I, I We've seen some people like all of a sudden they listed something they've had on the shelf for three years and it got bought out in a day because somebody was mm -hmm. desperately searching for it somewhere else in the country.
but it just was not your local customer that you normally do business with. Absolutely. I, th I think those are great points. And so Arturo actually had a, had a question uh, in the comments that I'm going to let Nikki uh, respond to. And then I'm going to ask Sarah if she sees similar things uh, with her customers and the manufacturing companies that she works with. But Arturo is saying, uh, what about absolute parts, right? And suggesting new parts available to replace it. So either equivalents or potentially updates of parts that may have been quoted three or four years ago. I, I would say that 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 would be, you know, best practices, right? So I don't have something that's the exact part number, but I have something that will do the same item. Are, are you seeing uh, that, I guess, five, six, 10 years ago, I was seeing very little of that being done, Nikki. Are you seeing more of that happening? Are you seeing people willing to go look for similar parts if it's not a, it has to be this exact part number per the engineering specifications? Uh it really depends. And it, it sometimes depends. Is it the buyer that's looking and is the buyer educated as to what they're buying and what the mm -hmm. critical specs are and what the trade-offs are and whether or not it's a part that they can upgrade without upgrading the entire machine? Sometimes there's a drop in replacement. A manufacturer you know, will say, this part's been discontinued. This is the recommended replacement. And then you have to be smart about you know, can you just drop it in or are there specs that are critical that are different? And do you need to look at upgrading the whole machine or, or not? Mm -hmm. And that conversation is so different depending on if it's the engineer doing the looking around um, or if it's a purchasing person or a buyer that knows anything about what they're buying or they're just getting a description out of their ERP and saying, I need to buy this. And sometimes there's such a disconnect that they have a distributor specific part number and they're trying to shop that around and ask for quotes. And it's like, well, that's not even a manufacturer's part number that anybody can match because it's specific to one particular vendor. Um, so the trends, I mean, I don't know that I can say like everybody's doing this or that, but we absolutely need a way to help these non-engineer buyers understand mm -hmm. that what the options are. So when people come to me and they say, I need part number X and I go look for it. Sometimes mm -hmm. I find it and we get lucky and you know what, let's fill the order and it's in stock. But when it's not, I always try to problem solve. Okay, what can we do? What, you know, can you take this part number, which is very similar, but maybe it has a different spec, you know, it has a coating on it that you don't need, but you could get away with. Or it's a, you know, screw t push terminal instead of a screw terminal or something that is not critical. Um, and sometimes the buyer knows and sometimes they don't. Sometimes we have to go a few layers back. You know, let me go ask the engineer or, you know, and it takes a long time because there are these, it's basically these emails and phone calls are very inefficient because there's multiple parties involved. Finding the stock that exists and connecting it to the market is a short term problem, you know, solution, because if there's a bunch of pockets of hidden obsolete parts, mm -hmm. that's great for now. Once they get found and used, they're gone. So then we still need to address this obsolescence problem which I think is, is a very multifaceted thing. It's not just on the procurement side, but it's on the maintenance, design, and operations side. Companies do need to make sure that they're keeping their equipment up to date and they're looking at you know obsolescence planning. Because at this point in time, when you're trying to react, if you don't have spares and you have an obsolete part and you're trying to replace it when a machine is down, you are in mm -hmm. the worst position possible. Um, and somebody might come and save you. And sometimes I'm that person and I love it, but like that is not a long-term solution. Absolutely. I, w I would absolutely agree that it's not a long-term solution. Uh, I know people who call it a hero complex with, within sales folks who are going out and finding that obsolete part, or I can do something for you. And they do the proverbial digging through the shelves in order to, to find the part in the back that um, in order to find the part in the back and actually keep them up and running. I find that most of the time that uh, other than folks like Nikki who have, you know, 17,000 distributors that they call all the time, most of the time that that's gone. Like we, we ran out of those spare parts covered in dust two or three years ago. So I think that that's absolutely a good point. Uh, Sarah, from, from your side, when you're dealing um, with, with end users, with manufacturers, are you seeing that they struggle through similar things where they're looking uh, for potentially obsolete parts and these obsolete parts are in other parts of industry? Or, or what is the, the main pain point that, uh, that, that you're seeing um, with, with your clients? Yeah, so I like to break a supply chain down for a manufacturer into two parts. First mm -hmm. mile 
and last mile. First mile is making sure you have the right supply base to mm -hmm. be able to get the parts and materials you need on time in full so you can meet your production schedule and therefore you can then ship your product to the end customer. So the first mile is getting the parts and materials you need on time. And the last mile is the process of getting your finished parts or materials to your customer on time. In the last couple of years, there's been a huge, huge focus on the last mile. Mm -hmm. So figuring out how to actually get your product to the end customer. I would argue that that's a big mistake and manufacturers should be prioritizing the first mile of their supply chain. If you do not have parts and materials, you cannot manufacture your product. Therefore, you have nothing to ship to your end customer. So our company plays in the first mile space. And the biggest challenge that we see manufacturers facing today is supply shortage. Ordering parts and materials from a supplier and the supplier not being able to fulfill the order. Now, that may be that they can fill partial. That may be that they can fill the order, but it's going to be two months late. That may be that they can't fulfill any of the order at all but the number one challenge our clients face is not being able to get the supply when they need it. Okay. I, I like that a lot. I'd like to, I'd like to focus a little bit more on, on first mile because as you mentioned, mm -hmm. last mile has been in the news. I think it's been talked about on the show, right? We, we've had conversation. So uh, when, when Aaron, uh, Prather, he was working at FedEx. He was on the show talking about robotics and drones. I think we had a conversation about drones delivering things. Um, I, I know people working on the Rivian electric vans for Amazon's last mile delivery, right? I think lots of people know that. But I, I think the, the struggle of first mile is, is real, right? The, the struggle of first mile is, can I get the items? And so I'd like to, I'd like to talk about that a, a little bit more. Uh, Karim, okay, let, let's let's go ahead and, and ask you um, what, based upon you know your experience in our conversations, is what is your experience in, in first mile and the the, the frustrations and, and pain points thereof? Yeah, so I think you, I mean, you brought a good point where there's a there were there was a lot of innovation in the last mile. A lot of companies, a lot of startups, a lot of um, a lot of money has been put up in the last mile without. With, with varying success, let's say. So it was, uh, it's, it's arguable. And if we solve that, I, I see a lot of companies kind of abandon that and just by see decide, okay, we're just going to try to outsource the last mile to some local companies. And so, and so some things have been solved in a way. But to be honest, I haven't, I've never heard of this concept of the first mile. I don't know. Nobody, it's not, it's not, I, I don't see a lot of innovation happening around it. I, I, I don't, you don't hear about it in the news. You don't hear those uh, buzzwords around. So I'm actually was curious about, um, I mean, Sarah and Nikki, what, what type of innovation have you seen in the first mile that were interesting? I mean, Source Day is one, of course, but um, have you seen any other interesting developments there that are worth pointing to that you think maybe can pick up in the next couple of years? I, I'm happy to bring one up that's not actually a technology innovation. It's just a change in mindset, which I think is actually mm -hmm. the most important thing. Yeah. And the there's been a big pivot in companies that really understand and value the supply chain and getting their products on time and in full is this shift in that your supplier is your most important stakeholder. Mm -hmm. So... Three years ago, you would ask almost any buyer and they would tell you that their internal stakeholders who run different departments or teams were their number one priority trying to win over and get engagement. So they would use them to so, so procurement could help source and procure and manage their contracts. Now, smart buyers will actually tell you their supplier is their most important stakeholder. And they've completely pivoted and shifted the entire structure of their team to put processes and systems in place 
to build out supplier management programs and to collaborate and have strong relationships with your suppliers. So that's the biggest mental shift that I have seen happen in the last 12 months. From a, an innovation standpoint, I would also say that data is so, so important. There's been a lot of talk about data. There's a lot of data solutions out there. I would argue that most people would tell you the data in their ERP is not very good and accurate and they can't trust it, which leads to a major challenge if you don't have good data. How do you know what to order? How do you know when to order? And how do you know who, who to order it from? Mm -hmm. So I think there's an opportunity for organizations to better innovate and find out a way to get better clean data for the first mile of their supply chain. So they can then take that data and make better buying decisions. And of course, the third would be that what the problem that we actually solve is this issue around purchase order changes. Mm -hmm. Companies issue purchase orders and our research shows that 52% of the time purchase orders change. So Dave, if you issue a purchase order with a hundred line items, mm -hmm. 52 of those hundred are going to have changes. And mm -hmm. if you ask a buyer how they manage those changes, if they have not embraced technology, they're doing mm -hmm. it through email and spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And then they're manually going back into the ERP and typing in those changes. Well, I know for me, if I got a thousand emails a day from suppliers about supplier changes, I would mm -hmm. miss an email. I would make a data entry error in a spreadsheet and I would definitely mm -hmm. make an error entering something into an ERP. Well, that error on a five cent part could shut down your production line for two weeks and have a significant impact on your revenue. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So I have so many pain points and frustrations to uh, to talk about of, of supplier uh, changes or, or per, I'm sorry, purchase order changes. But first, I want to let Nikki comment on, on first mile and perhaps what she's seeing changing. Are, are, are your the are the folks you guys are working with, Nikki? Are they more focused on first mile? Is is first mile even on their radar? Well, I guess it's a little bit different because we are sort of working currently in the distribution mm -hmm. space. Although I mm -hmm. am doing more work to help the vendors and, or manufacturers that are making, okay, and we're talking like PLCs, parts that go into machines primarily, automation machines. Mm -hmm. um, spares for manufacturers, right, MRO stuff is also important, but we work with a lot of panel builders, systems integrators, OEMs mm -hmm. that can't ship machines right now because there's a few pieces missing. You can't ship a machine if it doesn't have all the parts. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know if you would call that. I mean, the parts that go into a machine are technically first mile for a machine mm -hmm. builder, but it's last mile for the vendor of, let's say if it's, and I don't want to name names, but like the, the PLC vendor, right? Mm -hmm. For them, that's last mile, but, and their issue is the first mile. The reason they can't deliver product is because they're missing something on their bill of materials for the first mile, whether it's chips, which is oftentimes the case for electronic products, um, it might be certain polymers or plastics right now because of, you know, war and geopolitical stuff. It might be, I mean, there's a variety of different raw materials that go into uh, automation and electronic components. Um, and so that's another whole, you know, very complex reality right now. And they can't deliver because they can't get the goods, right? And then the machine builder can't deliver their machine because they can't get the goods. And then the manufacturer can't increase their capacity because they can't get the machines. It's you know, it, it, it's a whole thing. Um, so, yes, we're thinking a little bit about the first mile because we've started to help the vendors source the chips that they need to be able to produce the parts. Um, we're also seeing some more, you know, some vendors are buying, let's say, batches of chips and they're making a new part number that's just slightly different from the old part number because it's functionally equivalent, but some spec of the chip they used on this production run is different than the last one. And to most customers, it probably doesn't matter, but to customers with maybe extreme conditions that rely on the, the fringe specs of this part needs to work in, you know, extremely cold environments, maybe this new chip doesn't meet that spec. Um, yep. So there's just a lot of, in, in our industry, it's kind of, we've gone for a very long time buying the same thing from the same vendors. Ideally, we spec something in and we keep making the machine that way. And we send the same PO to the same vendor 
over and over and over. And, you know, the prices relatively stay the same. They go up a little bit every year, but you kind of can expect that, hey, you send your PO to your local distributor. They're going to fulfill it. You're good to go. That has gone out the window. And our industry is really not set up for this complex management of multiple vendors and sourcing from multiple vendors. We're very tied into, and in some cases, contractually, we have to buy a product from a specific company and we can't go elsewhere. And that's a huge problem right now because there's no flexibility. And then how do you figure out where else you can buy from? And even if you find somebody to set up an account and start a new relationship, I mean, it's just, it's a lot of paperwork, right? And just like Sarah saying, these purchase orders and these documents, we're sending in credit applications with bank mm -hmm. account information. We're sending credit card authorization forms via email um, or calling people and having them write down our credit card number and who knows where they're writing it down and whether or not they're being safe about it. Um, you know, setting up vendor terms, if I wanted to buy some power supplies from my local distributor last week, mm -hmm. And it's taken so long to set up the account that I bought them online somewhere instead for more because it just mm -hmm. is not worth the headache of spending the hours it takes to do the administrative tasks mm -hmm. to buy something from a new vendor for a one-time thing. Um, and that's really the problem, a big part of the problem that we're trying to solve you know, with Copeam is mm -hmm. just like Source Day is you know, automating the PO change communication, we need to have a better way to collaborate with vendors. Um, and I think the old days of just saying, okay, we're going to go with the best price or send out three RFQs and buy from whoever, you know, quotes us the cheapest. Mm -hmm. That is absolutely short term thinking because nowadays we have to work together. And like Sarah said, your suppliers are strategic stakeholders in your business and they can thank you. If you can't get goods, you can't make your product, you can't mm -hmm. sell anything, what are you going to do? Um, and I think we need to move away from the short term you know, what can you do for me on this order, you know, thinking, or I'm going to make a profit here on this one short term thing. We have to start thinking long term. How do we all help each other get through this and then have relationships where we can be flexible and collaborative in the way that we do things and not spend all of our extra energy on paperwork? Because I call a lot of distributors a lot of the time. And when they don't have something, they don't have the time or the energy or the will. I don't know why or what it is, but they don't ask how they can help me. They say, mm -hmm. sorry, I don't have this. You want me to check factory lead times? So I'm like, well, I already know the factory lead time. That's, that's why I'm calling you. And then they just say goodbye. Thank you. Because they are so busy and harrowed with emails and phone calls and all these things that they can't even take the time to try to establish a relationship, which is a sad indicator, you know, of, even if we wanted to try to do more business and find the right customers and all of that, it, it's very hard when you have people that are just buried in busy work and fighting fires all day long. Absolutely. I, I think that, that all of those are, are very good points. I, I think kind of to, to what Nikki, you were saying and Sarah, kind of you, your comments, a lot of it is a mindset shift and almost an organizational change shift, right? That there is not a piece of software that can suddenly come in and make this problem better. It's a it's a how we do business. Um, we need to change how we do that in order to be better as an organization, better as kind of an industry as a whole. So uh, I, I promised a story. So Sarah was saying on average 52% of items coming in on a purchase order change. Uh, so Sarah, I was doing some work with a client, right? So they make beers and seltzers similar to a la kind of like White Claw style uh, drinks. And they make lots of them. And almost every single one of them is a one-off, right? So they've got a couple of orders that will come in and will run the same quantity every month. But basically everything else is a one-off. It's by itself. They all change slightly. And one of their biggest pain points was, hey, I'm getting ready to go run this order. And then my, the internal group that, that comes and buys 10% of our product or, or one of the vendors is like, oh, I know you guys are getting ready to run this in a week or two weeks. I've decided I want to add more peanut butter to my beer, or I want to add this extract, or I want to add, you know, this fruit. And a big part of their issues were, hey, there is lead times for these, right? So if it's something that we can, we have on the shelf, we can add it, but it changes literally the entire recipe and how we do business along with that. But if it's not something that there are some drums of, uh, of fruit 
they take four or eight or 16 weeks to come in and they come in frozen. So you have to thaw them. So there are issues that they have of, hey, we are potentially in the process of running this. And now you want us to go back and kind of redo the whole process in order to add this, but it's going to add 16 weeks and we've got to dump what we have, or maybe in theory, leave it in a tank that we don't have tank space for. So that, that became a large issue. So it, it became a, with those guys, it was an organizational change, a mindset shift of at some point we have to lock in, you know, you guys have X amount of time to potentially change what this looks like, but call it a reliable lead time of four weeks. Once you're within four weeks, if you'd like to make any changes, then you guys go back to the end of the queue and that may be 16 weeks out. And there's, there's a cancellation charge because you guys have canceled the run that we, we have slotted in for that. And so for, for them, it was very much an, an organizational change. Is that now I'd like to go around and kind of get the thoughts. Sarah, is that the kind of organizational changes that you're seeing companies have to go through and make in order to be successful in the first mile? I would say the stakeholder management piece, absolutely. In your example, that was more of managing internal stakeholders mm -hmm. and getting buy-in on the entire process. My friend runs procurement and manufacturing for a company called Reese Foods. They have an office mm -hmm. in California, just opened an office here in Dallas. And when I was interviewing her a couple weeks ago, she mentioned how important it's been for her success to partner and collaborate with the ingredients and innovation team. Mm -hmm. Because going back to your example, if they come to her with a design or a product that is crazy to source and procure, it's going to have a huge impact at all aspects of the company if they're not able to get the parts or materials or things in a timely manner to hit production schedules. So yes, stakeholder management, whether it's internal or external, is absolutely imperative to make sure that you have a smooth operating first mile in your supply chain. Absolutely. Thank you. I, th I think that that is, uh, th that's a very good point. I would say kind of to, to add to your point, Sarah, I've seen more companies go back to the engineering teams many times and say, hey, what can we do to potentially optimize the process, right? You know, this product that we're using is very similar to the product that we were using in, in the last run of things. Can we use the same product and not have to order two slightly different products and, and hold two slightly different products on the shelf. So, so what can we do to minimize uh, different, different items a, as we go or, through the process? Or you have a Tesla that is mm -hmm. now redesigning their cars because of the chip shortage. Mm -hmm. So you also have the idea of instead of somebody asked earlier about using replacement parts, I'd go a step further and say companies are actually completely redesigning the products that they sell because of the supply chain challenges. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So uh, we actually had uh, Benson on earlier, I think in January from Opto22, and he spoke of in January how he and his organization were redesigning and re-engineering some of the products they use in order to keep items uh, on the shelf um, all the way back in January, and they were able to be successful in that. We've had some comments talk about how it doesn't fly in all industries. So especially very regulated uh, industries, pharmaceuticals, uh, medical devices, industries like that, it becomes uh, this is what we've engineered the, the product for. We cannot have any changes of that. So there are certainly some industries that uh, that have issues making changes or, or re-engineering kind of on the fly. But I think th those are fantastic examples. Nikki, w what are you seeing organizational change-wise, uh, things that people are doing in order to stay competitive in this market? So I think um, better collaboration between uh, the engineering and purchasing functions is critical at this point. A lot of times in the past, engineers could design whatever they want and then just mm -hmm. throw it over the fence and say, go buy it. Um, and that's kind of no longer the case. Just like purchase order changes, you have to be mm -hmm. amenable to, because we're seeing a lot more purchasers and buyers going, okay, I have to go back to engineering now mm -hmm. and figure out if this spec is important or 
what is the cost, you know, what's the trade off between buying these parts at inflated prices because we found them and they exist, but there's a shortage in the market and the price reflects that versus redesigning the product, spending the engineering mm -hmm. time um, to redesign it. And then, you know, you redesign it to use what? Something that may be in short supply again three months from now? Or, mm -hmm. you know, we definitely need more interoperability in our industry. And that's, you know, an unfortunate function of this sort of go to market strategies and competitive climate is is trying to promote people into using certain technologies. I think um, manufacturers and machine builders are starting to look at, OK, how can we uh, utilize multiple more different vendors and be more flexible? Um, and part of that has to do with the entire support ecosystem around these technologies. Right. Uh, to to not so much to the organizational change piece, but supply chains are just really complex things. They're, they are global. And as much as we want to reshore manufacturing, um, it is impossible to potentially, you know, for instance, move a mine of rare earth m minerals or sources of gases and uh, highly regulated industries. Speaking of that, semiconductors is one of them, um, not so much necessarily for the regulation, but for the processes. They are so niche and specific and they have to be so clean that, you know, you mm -hmm. can't use a regular valve for things or tubing, it has to be high purity, semiconductor standard, very specific. And there are not, you know, in some cases, there's one or two companies in the world that can produce the parts that go into semiconductor machinery. So even when we talk about increasing chip fab capacity, there's supply chain constraints in building more chip fabs. Um, so it is very much a systems problem where there are a lot of inputs and a lot of outputs. And every time we adjust one, you have to adjust the whole system. And I think we have to start thinking more in terms of collaboration and not silos, both internally in our companies between departments and externally with our customers and in some cases our competitors. You know, we can all, you know, uh, go at this alone and hit our heads against the walls competing with each other and we all lose because none of us have product to sell or machines to ship. And that doesn't help anyone. Um, so I think, you know, in my mind, the biggest mindset change we need in our industry is working together instead of, you know, this constant competitive, you know, I'm going to keep my customer only with me or, um, you know, at this point, we, we all need to figure out how to do this. And then in the long run, how to once this, you know, short term problem is overcome, how do we change our industry so that not every big geopolitical issue or natural disaster or some other thing knocks us out once again um, because we need to automate more and you know coming from the automation side of manufacturing you know we we need more and more and more of it and there's plenty of business out there for everyone we just need to figure out how to work together i would also say dave and nikki that i think something else that's really been important this year is the pivot away from single sourcing mm -hmm. So many, many manufacturers rely on one supplier for key parts and materials. They've had long-term relationships. They have no second or third option. Mm -hmm. Well, this became a major, major issue when COVID hit and this single sourced supplier could no longer fulfill the orders. So I would say that one of the things I've seen buyers and supply chain leaders prioritizing this year more than most other things is going out and finding multiple suppliers for absolutely everything you buy. And when I say multiple suppliers, it's also important to look at that from a, a perspective of where your suppliers are located and making sure that if you do have multiple suppliers, they're in different parts of the world. So you look at Russia and Ukraine and some of the other things happening right now. If my entire supply base right now is in Russia or Ukraine, I'm screwed. Mm -hmm. So I want to make sure that I have a supply base that is in multiple locations in case of a natural disaster, in case of a war, in case something happens. So if you are working in manufacturing and you have single sourced items, I highly recommend prioritizing, establishing, and building out your supply base. Absolutely. I, think, yeah. I was oh, going to say, I think, 
all of those are fantastic. I think all of those are fantastic points. And to distill it down, I, I think Nikki said something to the effect of supply chains are very complex. Uh, I, I think that that is that is the highlight for everything that we've just said. Karim, uh, what, what was your comment going to be? Yeah, I, I was wondering if you had any, maybe Sarah, maybe if you had any framework or something to suggest on around supply diversification, right? Uh, how many suppliers should you think about? How, how many different suppliers? How do you evaluate these regions? Because it's, um, I think for bigger companies, that makes sense. Maybe they have the manpower to do that. But I think for mid-size uh, companies, maybe they don't have that expertise in-house. Maybe they don't have the manpower to do it. Uh, where should they get started? Well, how, how yeah. should they think about it with limited resources? So for small and mid-market manufacturers that want to diversify the supply base, two things I'd recommend to start with. One is, can you bring anything in-house? I've seen companies bring some manufacturing in-house where they've never, never thought about it, produced something before, and it's worked out very well for them because, one, they're depending on themselves to produce and manage their own supply, but it's also opened up and created additional revenue streams where they can then sell that product to competitors and other manufacturers in the market. The second thing is look locally. There are a lot of opportunities in local markets and in local economies that have not been explored. So leverage your network, go on LinkedIn, go on your dark social channels, your networking groups, ask other people in wherever you're based who they're using and who some of their local suppliers are. And I think some people will be really surprised and they didn't realize they had such a wealth of suppliers in a more local region um, than mm -hmm. they've ever considered before. And then mm -hmm. the third is, is there a way to re-engineer some of your products where you can change up your supply base? I mentioned the Tesla example, but I'm seeing lots of other manufacturers do this as well, where they have certain set of suppliers that is diversified and perform well, and they're struggling to find other suppliers in other areas. Look at a, a product redesign, and that may help you with your supply base. I love that. I think that those are, those are great examples. Uh, as we are getting close to the end of this, I, I again want to thank Phoenix Contact uh, for sponsoring uh, for, for sponsoring this theme. And Vlad's not here, so typically this is the point where I would slightly embarrass him, asking people to subscribe to Solus PLC. But but he's not here, so just imagine Vlad up in the top left corner, slightly blushing as I talk about the new Phoenix Contact Solus PLC collaboration course that they have out. So if you're look, looking to figure out how to use a PLC next, which is when Vlad would normally hold up a PLC next, but again, he's not here. Uh, go check out Solus PLC. There, there is a new course that has come out uh, at the end of last month. You can learn how to do ladder logic, structure text, function block. There, there's Modbus. They're looking to add uh, MQTT and a bunch of additional items to that course uh, in the coming future, plus the whole learn how to start from everything with the PLC next. Uh, engineering program. Again, we want to thank uh, Phoenix Contact for sponsoring this. Check out solusplc.com. You'll have all of the information on the PLC Next uh, starter course in there. Uh, as we are running close to up to time, this has been an amazing conversation. I think I say it every week. This is one of those that we could go talk for six hours, and I don't think even six hours would get us like in into the depths of supply chain. So uh, last questions uh, as we go around, but before we wrap up, um, Sarah, can you tell everyone where you talk about all things supply? I know you have two, three shows that where you talk about supply chain. Can you tell everyone uh, where they can find you as you talk about supply chain and maybe any last, uh, last closing thoughts or comments, please? Yeah, so best way to reach me is on LinkedIn. I'm a bit of a LinkedIn addict. Two hashtags that, that I've created that I use are manufacturing maven and women in ERP. I host four LinkedIn live shows, so I go live every single week. I've got a voice of supply chain show, a women in ERP show, supply chain trend show, and a manufacturing woe show, which is probably most relevant to this audience. I have guests come on. Nikki's coming on. 
Uh, Dave is actually coming on the show as well. And people talk about the absolute train wrecks and nightmares that they've lived through and survived in manufacturing. It's the ugly, dirty, we don't want to we don't want to sugarcoat anything type show. So if that's of interest to you, if you want to listen in ever and or be, come on as a guest, shoot me a note on LinkedIn. I would say my closing thought is take a look at your supply chain and anything that is being done that can be automated, try to automate it so you can free up your team's time to focus on more strategic activities. I love it. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, but before I let Nikki uh, go and, uh, and talk about the, the same things, there are so many comments. Everyone, thank you for all of the comments and questions. It's literally blowing up the, the entire right-hand side of my screen. If we have not got to them, we will absolutely get to them um, a after the show. Uh, with that, Nikki, can you tell everyone uh, where to find you about Automation Ladies and uh, any closing thoughts on supply chain, please? Sure, yeah. So you can Find me on LinkedIn as well. I, I don't have time for any other social media. Um, I've got kids and I do this. I'm in it all day. So uh, message me on LinkedIn. Uh, if you're looking for parts, you can go to quotebeam.com. And some of it is online. Some of it is in the process of being online. So always just drop a note in the chat when you're looking for something. We will help you. Um, so to the point of Companies that don't have the resources or the know-how or the time to find multiple suppliers to chase their problem, you know, 20% of the bomb that they just can't deliver, that's what we can help with right now. It's our low-hanging fruit while we're developing and connecting all this data and all these vendors. It's a big, complex problem we're tackling, but we think it's necessary and we're doing it. And in the meantime, we're filling the gaps by using our network and relationships and you know, community, right? Sometimes I'm not the one that solves the problem, but I know somebody that can solve the problem. You know, a systems integrator that stocked a bunch of stuff that they're willing to let go of, you know, for somebody that really needs it, but it, they're not out there advertising it. You know, those sorts of things I can help with. Also different distributors around the world have had different habits. You know, there are places where they're used to stocking more. They have more stocking orders available than mm -hmm. here in the US. But to Sarah's point, you know, it's difficult for a small company to even buy something overseas. I mean, it's complicated. You think you can just buy it and get it shipped with DHL or FedEx, and it's not that simple. Um, so we can help with all those problems and, and just be kind of that helping hand. We, If you're a machine builder and you you know need some better way to source your bill of materials, we're developing stuff for that. I really want to talk to everyone in the community, learn how we can help them solve their problems. Um, not to just pitch that we, you know, we're selling parts. It's really the least of my <laughs> interest, but that's where I can be of a lot of help right now. So please reach out to me for that. Um, automation ladies. Yeah. So I, you know, our industry is not terribly diverse. We're all trying to do better. Right. And uh, I've been in it for a long time and I've always just kind of oftentimes been kind of the only woman in the room or one of a handful or a few and LinkedIn is an amazing community where I've been able to find some ladies in my space that are into the weird stuff that I am and love robots and, you know, valves and burner controls as much as I do. And uh, Allie and I found each other. She's out in the field all the time building stuff. I sometimes help her, you know, find parts and ship them to wherever she's building. And we decided that, you know, there are probably people out there that want to have those conversations and talk about, you know, all the different things that we get up to in automation. Um, we love to talk to different people in different positions. I personally don't, I know more about automation than I do about, you know, mill rights or uh, maintenance department. Uh, there's all kinds of stuff to learn in the, in the industry. And we just want to bring some different conversations that maybe the C-suite and the executives and the thought leaders aren't having. Um, and it's just, you know, adding a little bit to the discourse, bringing some of us into the community. That's really what Automation Ladies is about. So you can follow our page uh, we are still in the process of getting our podcast episodes um, out there. Uh, they're in production, but we are going to be starting up doing it more of a regular as a LinkedIn Live because part of, you know, the biggest bottleneck is us. We're so busy with our day to day work and we just got to force ourselves to get out there. So you'll see our LinkedIn Lives if you go um, to our page. They'll be starting very soon. Um, so, yeah, that's where you can find me and, you know, check out Automation Ladies and, if we can help you through quote beam or any other way with whatever problems you're having um, or, you know, we can help be part of the team. If you don't have the time or the resources to find those extra vendors that you should be working with or uh, 
We're working on also just standardizing some of the data and attributes across all the different manufacturers, because of course they don't want to do it themselves, right? But it's for the end user, it's absolutely necessary or the machine builder to be able to find alternatives. Um, and when everybody's data is in different formats and different places and different types of PDFs and spreadsheets, and you know, it's just very difficult to, to get that done. Um, so anybody that wants to help with that cause by bringing their data and you know being a part of the change, please, please come find me. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much, Nikki. Uh, thank you everyone for being here. Again, this has been uh, Manufacturing Hub, the first of what I hope will be many uh, supply chain roundtables. Please feel free to like and subscribe and do all of those great things. And we will see everyone back uh, Wednesday, same time, same place. Thank you all. Bye-bye. Thank you.